Okay, so we are moving along in CIS 41A, and this week we're going to touch on a little bit more vulnerability management and a little bit more scanning. I know that some of you are in the 27B, which there are overlapping materials, so when I write the exercises, you do see some similarity, but you will have a little bit, you know, different um, steps or tools, depending on the type of activities that we're going to build for that particular exercise goal. So a lot of the concepts is going to be repetitive throughout the security classes. We're going to keep telling you about vulnerability, threats, and risk until you get so tired of it, right? Um, until it really sticks. <laughs> um, so you are going to hear a lot of the, the repetitive things, but hopefully I'll be able to give you some additional information that will be useful for analysis. So in uh, chapter four, it focuses on vulnerability. And in vulnerability management, you are going to aim to identify, prioritize, and remediate or reduce the vulnerability for, for your organization so that the attackers cannot exploit the vulnerability and damage your assets. So the effective management program will consist of the three approaches, okay? And from a perspective of an analyst or a pen tester, uh, you would see that you would need to scan the assets for vulnerability. And we're talking about system where you can perform the scan. And in the case, if you're looking at physical vulnerability, you have to do the identification process through inventory and, and really looking at the description and how it's used. But we're talking about system now, right? Like could be application, it could be server. So we can scan the enterprise assets for vulnerabilities. And you basically have so many different types of scans. We can use Nessus, Nmap. Uh, today we're gonna do a, a field script that's gonna tie back into vulnerability assessment. Um, and there are other tools that are specific, right? If you have learned about Nikto, you can use that for web base or web server, web application. So we can use the tool to perform the scan and we would use a defined workflow to remediate. So that means that you have a layout steps on how you can reduce the vulnerability in different area and how the impact of that would be on other steps or other systems that are related. And you will continue to assess and manage your vulnerability. And this is not a one step and you're done for the year, right? We would have to continue to do that throughout the time that we're using our system. So to answer the question for number one, it says, why is vulnerability management important in an organization? And we can say that it helps the organization understand hi, the current state of security by identifying, prioritizing. So that means that you can quantify based on, you know, how severe the severity level, right? You can also qualify based on like low, medium, or high in priority and remediate vulnerability. Sometimes we cannot remove it completely and we're gonna to have to accept that, right? For example, in order to run a certain type of software, that software is built with some vulnerability and there's no patch for it. So you still have to assess it and you will need to find ways to reduce the attack surface by looking at that vulnerability. What else can we do to make sure that it's not gonna be an area that's going to be attacked or capitalize on that vulnerability. So it tells you that to remediate vulnerabilities before the attacker exploits them and undermine the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the organization assets. So as we mentioned about the approaches, the effective approaches in building effective vulnerability management program 
it would include periodically scan enterprise asset, assets and vulnerability and if not more regularly, right? You might have system and tools that are already doing that in the back, but you need to know that when you assess vulnerability, when you do the scan, you've seen it when you scan like, uh, an, an, you know, part of the infrastructure, I mean, just talking about like maybe a group of servers, it doesn't exactly, it's gonna be very fast, right? And it's gonna take up resources, bandwidth, network traffic. So if you're doing remote systems, so if I'm scanning, you know, a few of my branches, it's not exactly gonna be fast and easy and it's gonna take up resources. So that's why we say periodic, it's, it's not something that we can do day to day or all the time or live. There might be system that we can use to monitor and we can track vulnerability. So once we found it, right, it can get be added to the list of vulnerability and we will be able to go through and remediate it. So we would regularly use define workflow to remediate the vulnerabilities. And we would need to manage assets and provide current state of the enterprise security. So as an analyst, this is gonna be the area that you operate, okay? You have to regularly looking at the impact of these vulnerabilities with the goods and you know the assets in the organization, the system, the people, could be physical space and so on. And so if you have a huge gap, you must address it. That means that if you have low security, because you have many vulnerabilities that are found that's not addressed, known vulnerabilities, right? Then we must address it based on the priority. Any question? So we'll do a few scans today. Hi, a little bit like CS27B. I want to expand a little bit on it, right? Showing you, you know, similar, the same tools we're using. Because basically it's the same group of tools that you're going to see throughout. Um. And then we will introduce other tools down the line. But vulnerability knowledge is, is very important and you want to build out that knowledge base, right? So when we find vulnerability, it's still part of the recon process, which is the first, the beginning step for assessment. Okay. Let's go back to the notes. So here it talks about, bless you, um, identifying the requirements. And a lot of this tying back to the regulation body, right? Compliance requirement for your company. Um, we don't just do it because it's fun or, you know, this is required and how often you should do it. Sometimes it's not required, but it's good practice. So... I list here the organizations that actually require some of the areas. So for identifying requirements, you need to look at internal and external requirements. Internal meaning the companies, how they would be able to maintain operation based on vulnerability scanning because we reduce um, you know, the, the area of attack by, by mitigating or reducing vulnerability. Um, so for healthcare with HIPAA, it regulates that healthcare providers, insurance companies, and their businesses handle protected information. It does not require organization to conduct vulnerability scanning, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, right? So the regulation said that you don't need to right now, right? But it doesn't mean that you, you know, to really keep the, the credibility of the company we need to perform security assessment. And when we perform security assessment or even pen testing, you have to perform vulnerability scanning. So it doesn't require that. GLBA, Graham Leach Bibli Act. So this is for financial institution like banks, uh, 
like Visa company that that requires financial transaction. Um, and it governs how financial systems handle customer financial records. It does not require organization to conduct vulnerability scanning. So as you can see, when we have when we talk about data privacy and how that plays a big role, right? Um, we have to look back on you know some of the vulnerable vulnerable area in how we retain data, how we store data, how we move data, and whether we're looking at vulnerabilities. Sarbanes-Oxley Act, this is for companies that are on um, the stock market. SOX, this is for financial reporting and financial pro data protection. Um, so for example, if you're looking at like companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, things that you can, uh, companies that you can purchase stocks from, right? that they will re be required to have financial reporting quarterly or at least twice a year, but normally quarterly. So that means that the SOX compliant company require testing and control. This is stated in the SOX. I, I looked through the document, right? Sarbanes-Oxley Act required testing and control, meaning what? Pen testing. Right, vulnerability, testing the boundaries of your network and your applications. Um, so that's required. PCI DSS, companies that take transactional credit card, right, handle credit cards, requires vulnerability four times a year. Okay, four times a year. Then we got us, right? If we're looking at federal government, the FISMA area, so government agency, public sector entity, uh, county, city, etc. Right, it does require vulnerability management program. Also, they require that we have to make sure that the controls are in place. So after that, you gotta make sure that you have defense tactic to have risk management program. And then with that, we would need to implement standards and qualify the level of impact. So your risk management program, it needs to be part of your security plan for FISMA. And it would look something like this. You would define your objective you would define what level is low, moderate, and high, kind of like a, like how you would grade, right, them or rank them. So you would go through and look at your objective, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You would do that for various technologies, okay? Could be system, could be application, could be websites, could be, you know, resources that you provide through your computing systems. Isn't that fun? This is our job. <laughs> All right. It pay good to do that actually. Okay. So the areas of consideration when you're looking at your vulnerability targets. Okay. You need to look at how your data is classified when it's stored, processed, transmitted. So that means that how your data is saved or retained, how it's processed, and that could be modified, changed, sometime if it's financial data, right? That could be transactional updates. Um, or it could be designed where they do edits and remodified and then shared, how it's transmitted. That could be web access or, you know, through permission control, share folders email, et cetera. So why do I need to do that, right? I would need to really see how the data is classified. If public data have more information than it should be, like if it's actually private, but it's classified as public, that could be a vulnerable issue, right? That would be an area that I need to fix.
Oh, I, I I forgot to mention number four, but number four, you saw that with the notes. So for FISMA, how should vulnerability assessment be implemented in the, the federal agency? Your information system and hosted application are scanned for vulnerability to determine enumerating platforms, software flaws, or improper configuration. Those are the vulnerable areas of those things in general. And we saw, you know, that's a requirement. So in, our, in order to pass your IT audits, you must have that. And if it says so many times, that's what you need to have documented that you have done it at this time throughout the year. So this is why you see not because of regulation. And now some company would do more than what's needed, right? So I think that having more of a proactive approach. So if let's say that it's required one time a year, some company would do twice or three or as often as needed. Sometimes, you know, when you have upgrade of systems, a lot of the times they do that. So that way you can see how the changes would impact your infrastructure because those changes might not be all positive, right? I might integrate new servers um, or network appliances to be able to have more throughput and more productivity in my in my environment or my company. But we need to assess to really see that, you know, new software products and new systems, is that going to have to, you know, it's, is it going to lower our security level right now and in the long run? So normally after implementation, we go back and reassess, right? And we also check to see if it's, you know, effective. But security area, we want to assess that. So for five, as I mentioned, after you would look at connected public and semi-public and private systems. So that means what? Your private networks or your servers that's on the inside. And then you have your public servers and your systems. And then you have the DMZ, right? Public facing. Sometime you would have intranet. So those are the things that really needs to be assessed. The services that are being used by the system. So let's say that if I have an FTP server and it's been there for 30 years, I want to assess it. And over time, I need to do that, right? To see if there's a need for it, if it causes any vulnerability in my environment, because that's an open port and that's an open service that we made available. Now you can retire a certain service, but you have to you know, transgress to it. You can't just turn it off, right? We wanna make sure that we gradually do that so that way the user is not truly highly impacted, but at the same time, you know, if it's, if it's causing a lot of security impact or high impact on security, that is a priority. So you have to make a decision on how soon that we need to turn that off. What is the level of impact with the users and our operation compared to how you know somebody can go through that service and be able to attack us and take us down. You have to look at your system role in production, testing and development. So a lot of the decision and the recommendation coming from the, well, the recommendation coming from the analyst and going to the decision maker is really going to have to look at a lot of these areas on how the, the vulnerability management plays in the big picture of your company, financial impact. So how can we determine how often we should scan? And what kind of information that needs to be scanned? So the type of information that would allow us to determine the frequency in your scanning is going to be your risk appetite. How much are they willing to accept? Okay. 
And as I mentioned to you before, risk is usually quantified to the dollars. So let's say that it would take more resources for them to manage that risk, uh, $100,000, where they can just accept that risk and pay a $25,000 fine, then they would accept the risk and pay the fine. Okay. But if let's say that to fix a problem, right, to reduce that risk cost them a hundred thousand dollars, but then the, the impact of the security, if they don't reduce that risk, will cost them more than a hundred thousand dollars, then they would fix the risk. Okay. That's obvious decision, right? So as an analyst, you need to accumulate that list of risks. Provide it to your managers and the decision maker and say, and this will be quantified to this much. Bless you. If we accept this risk, right? For example, unpatched software, our software is still working, that's fine, right? But if, if that software is crippled and it's not gonna impact other software and, and so on, then this is how much money we're gonna lose. And so they would compare and they say, okay, right? We're gonna look at the regulatory requirements. We touched a little bit on that earlier. Corporate policies inside your internal requirements. Technical constraints. So example, right? You might have older system, legacy system servers are still running, but you cannot do much to, um, to scan those, right? And or reduce the vulnerability in those because software has been maybe retired, no, 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 no longer supported, but you still need those software for maybe like historical data. So sometimes system constraints with hardware and software, you have to look at that. Compatibility issues with OSs and so on, because upgrading software means what? Big dollars. Okay, upgrading hardware, same thing. You upgrade hardware, you have to upgrade software because they go together. So when we implement upgrade, it just mean big dollars. And then that can also change your security landscape. And then your license limitations. So these are some of the, the things that would play a big role in how you would determine how frequent you can scan. Any question? Okay, so now... Um, I added a link to the standards. So if you're interested, you can take a look at the federal processing standards. Um, so all of these things have been provided through NIST um, publications. So in this industry, at this point in time, you already have a lot of things that's established for you. You just need to reference a lot of these documentation to be able to build out your security plan. Okay, so for FISMA, they require that you need to identify and report any kind of new issues. Most of the time we do, we do report it, right? And your tools would allow you to do that. You have to analyze the report and this is where the, the security analyst plays in. Right, this is where your role is to look at the reports and look at how the results can implement control to reduce your risk. So I put down a lot of information on what NIST is offering, all of these things, the 10 steps, I'm sorry, eight controls and enhancement. And then identifying targets, we just answered that question, so. So here's a screenshot of Nessus. This is made by Tenable. If you get the professional version, I think it runs roughly two to $4,000 per license. Uh, I think it's over 2,000, I believe. You can get the home edition for free. This software does take a long time because it does the query of all the connected devices and then it examine each of the device one by one. So if you have 40,000 connected system, 
guess what you're gonna do? Go get dinner, right? Watch a movie, do other scans while you're at it, come back to it and it's still running, okay? So just keep in mind that when you scan like this, take a lot of resources and it's gonna take a while. Yeah. Um, depends on your role. So yeah, a lot of times when you are scanning things, you don't really have a huge window. Um, you know, scanning sometimes require you to, to kind of take a lot of network bandwidth so we don't do it during operation. So it, they will tell you, oh, this is the company kind of closed between whatever, but IT is still working, right? Uh, let's say at 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. and you, you have that time. And if it doesn't finish, you're going to have to kind of build out whatever the report is. But sometimes you can take an image of that system and then scan it. That's another way. So you have to be creative and think out of the box. How can you address the problem in that window of time? Okay. Because you're like, oh, I can't do my job because it's going to take four or five days or a week. That's not the answer, right? They're going to say find another job. <laughs> so we're going to have to think about, oh, we can take an image of it. We can play it into a virtual machine or put it on another system and then we can scan it. And then at that moment in time, you would have some kind of result. Um, so active scanning and passive scanning. I think I talked a lot about this, right? So for your active scanning, very noisy. That means that, you know, the it, it will... It's not stealthy. The system will see you. That's correct. And you can accidentally exploit the vulnerability and interfere other system functions, right? So that might cause more damage. So just got to be careful. And then if blocked by firewall or network or controls, you're going to see that today when you do the lab. At one point, I'm going to have you disable the firewall because you can't, you can't see proxy or whatever, right? And sometimes that needs to be done. And then the passive scanning is stealthy and the, you know, it won't see you. So your scope is important. How much can you scan? What's the extent of the scan? How many system or which system can you scan? Technical measurement of the testing system and how many tests can you perform? These needs to be approved, authorized, and documented. And when you scan, you document it. This such and such system, I'm talking about host name, all of that, even if it's 50 characters, you're going to have to write it down, okay? <laughs> no shortcuts. So the difference between the active and the passive scan, we talked about that. The active scanner interacts with the scan host to identify the services and the vulnerability. The passive scanners monitor the network and uses similar techniques as intrusion detection system to identify signatures, outdated systems, applications, and report the results to the administrators. So main difference is the interaction, right? So for the scope, how do you determine how big of a scope that you should work with for vulnerability scan? Number one, if you are a consultant, if you do this as an external entity coming in, they're going to tell you, right? Sometimes you, you have to help them with determining that scope, but a lot of times they're going to tell you, oh, we want you to scan these. So if you need to decide, you would say that the, the scope is going to be the, the type, the amount of the systems is going to be how you're going to measure for the test to be performed. So if let's say that you only your area is only going to be for database, that's what you're going to do, right? We do not look beyond our scope. That's the scope that we are set to do. Even if you sometimes you can, sometimes that's linked to other things right? Like your web applications because it's tied to database. 
A lot of the times database is linked to web app. That's how you can access the database. If they ask for a certain segment or certain systems on the on the network, like certain servers, your scope will be just those. And so that means that you can segment your scope for increments of scan. You don't have to do everybody all at once. That can be a lot, and it would take a lot of bandwidth and resources on your enterprise network. Right, so in the period of a week, I can divide up my tasks based on the smaller scope. And you would report for the smaller scope and then combine them for a larger reporting. Right, it's like fixing a house or building a house. You would need to build one room at a time or the frame and then some part of it, right? Now, if you have a larger team, you're able to, to have the scope complete quicker, of course. So this is why sometimes companies will opt for security service because they just have uh, more resources as far as people and systems to be able to perform the scan versus having one internal security professional. Any question? So we need to base on the amount of systems that we have, right? Like 400 is different than 40,000. <laughs> So you don't, you you know, scanning 40,000 system can be a tremendous task. So we can segment that to the smaller subscope and then we'll work, work out and combine, right? But scanning 400 system might be achievable in a certain amount of time as well. Also systems are already, so a lot of the times when you're scanning systems, these systems have security measure in place. So sometimes it's not as responsive as it should, right? It's gonna you're gonna have blockage and you're gonna have to find ways around that to get together to see if you can get around that. Right. That will be a vulnerability. So is it okay for me to just run in map for all the computers? It's fine if you just want one perspective, right? So in in technology, we know that we have to validate to get the same type of data across the board. So you want to have multiple tools. So for number nine, is this a comprehensive vulnerability management program? Why is a variety of scan per perspectives are used? It's really to look at different results or I'm sorry, set the results in different location of the network to identify vulnerability, but it also allows you to validate. And sometimes we need to scan on the inside, sometimes we need to scan on the outside, and we need to provide views for internal and external threat actors. So on the inside, that's different than the outside. So having additional perspective, that's also important. I like to use multiple tools only because I wanna validate things that it should match up. Some tools are better than the others, of course. Some tools will find it and some tools don't. It's really depending on how that tool is developed. And the libraries, right? The, 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 the vulnerabilities library that's attached to that tool. However, if we're finding a common type of result, we would know, right? But the ultimately the different perspective really shows you how you know attack would be different from the outside coming in and the inside if they are internal threat. So just like any kind of software that we work with, regular updates, patch, and plugins is a must, right? So for example, if you're using Burp Suite, you know that it uses Java. 
right? So where do I go and find this information? In the development tool documentation, it tells you everything that you need to know about that software. What kind of plugins that it needs, what kind of, you know, additional resources that's required for that software. So when you update the software, a lot of the times, you know, developer would integrate like updating with the software packages that's used. And with that, we would reduce some vulnerabilities. And some software with the patch, it pulls out security, right? Security with protocols, for connectivity, and so on. So we want to have regular updates. This is why Linux is great because you can do all the updates in one command, right? Instead of Windows, you gotta run the updates and download and then install the updates. Restart multiple times depending on the number of software you have. But before you run Windows update, you gotta test the updates. But all OS is updates. You need to test the updates. Okay, that's a good practice, especially Windows. So here it shows you a little bit on how sensitive you want the scan to be. And just like any scan, you're going to have false positive and negative, right? Sometimes it detects it, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it over detects. So in my opinion, no software is really perfect. Um, and then for the network scan, we touched on this before, right? So looking at OSs, databases, application, credential scans, connected system, connected services, for the active scan and map is a really good one for that. And here it talks about perspective. So for the external scan, it is required by PCI DSS, the credit card one, right? The one that accepts credit card transactions, whether you're doing on online or, you know, the actual physical card or Apple Pay, et cetera, any kind of payment system would be required through PCI DSS. So they require that you have an external scan. And it needs to be conducted by the approved vendors. <laughs> so many requirements, right? So for the maintenance, we talked about all of the, the patching, the plugins, and then here's the workflow that we mentioned earlier. So the remediation workflow, this would allow you to prioritize what's vulnerable, what's first and what's not, right? Your priority high, or sometimes company will call it critical. And that way we can track and automate. So we test, detect, so test to find it, and then remediate it. And we would do a rotational basis so you can do a schedule scan. Some of this can be automated too, right? You don't have to sit there and click start, 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 right? You can, all of these tools, most of them have APIs, which is wonderful. And you can just add it to your script, right? Put in your target server or systems. So the difference between ongoing and continuous, continuous does monitor and check the changes in vulnerability, and then ongoing is like schedule basis. So here I give you some levels that you can see critically. So the, the, the criticality of the system and how it's affected with by the vulnerability, that would be the priority, right? The difficulty of remediation of the vulnerability that and you can use ratings to consider this, that's gonna tell you the, the, the priority level. How severely is the vulnerability, right? You can use the, the CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Most of these documented, they have a scoring system, um, especially if you're looking at Mitre, right? And then exposure of the vulnerability, potential exploit, is that a common exploit? 
and so on, right? Before WannaCry came out, you know, nobody kind of pay attention to it, right? WannaCry was something that was there, but, you know, and it became very popular very quick because everybody was crippled by it, actually. And you can implement sandbox. We just touched on that earlier. Okay. So we talked about um the maintenance, like updates, patch plugins, and keep up the CVEs and reduce the bugs. The type of vulnerability scans that are scheduled monthly. We talked about that being ongoing instead of, you know, compared to the other one that's monitoring. That's live. And I think that is probably a choice, um, you know, depending on the resources that you have in the organization, the, the, the people that can, you know, report or the system that can report, right? Now we integrate some system that have AI. So even with that, you still have the human check behind it. So how is the vulnerability report used for remediation? So what's the outcome of this, right? You write that up that, that document and it lists all of these in vulnerability information and how we can go through. So we would use that to be able to remediate. So that would map out all the vulnerability to the particular type of systems and segment of the network so that way you can remediate. And we would go through based on the level of priority or the criticality of the vulnerability impacting the operations. So if it's highly critical, right, that's the one to address first. I like using quantification, uh, but you know, some a lot of times you do see, see some area that qualification works. Because what's the difference between, you know, one that's kind of medium and it's high and medium, you know? So we kind of have to, if you give it a score or a number, it's more distinguishable between a seven and a five, right? Or a six and a five. And you can also give a range of the score in the qualification if, you, if you're looking at like the impact level. We'll do some of the exercise when we do the risk part. So for 13, how should vulnerability remediation be prioritized? Um, we addressed that through the notes earlier based on critical levels, difficulty of remediation, severity level, and exploitation potential. If you're using a web app, this is also known as bug. For, 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 I'm sorry, web app assessment is fuzzy. We'll do some of that. I think I did a little bit of this in Python programming for security as well. Many of these tools, like I mentioned, has um, application programming interface or API. That means that it can be act as a a middle program to your program so you can incorporate that. And they have BuzzDB, they have a lot of different tools that you can use. Them. Any questions? So as you progress in the cybersecurity classes, right, as you move on to the higher level, the concepts also change. A lot of the things we touch, we come back to what you've learned at the beginning, but it's going to expand in specific area, right? Like earlier, you saw that there's compliance. In a lot of the classes in the back, the higher bachelor classes and the master, they teach you about management aspect on how to make a decision for regulation purposes or for 
based on you know reading these recommendations from the report from analysts or analysis. So you know you would see that it's expanded compliance, governance, and so on. Question. Okay, so let's come back here. Um, so here it talks about how if you can't fix the problem right away or if you accept the risk, if you want to overcome the vulnerability scanning risk, right? With that, we would have the risk. Um, you know, here it talks about how you can tune scans to to use less bandwidth uh, because scan does use a lot of bandwidth. You can schedule the scan when it's not during operation hour. For commitment, you need to have an MOU, it stands for Memorandum of Understanding and Service Level Agreement for the expectation of performance. So let's say that you work for a company and they ask you for a decision whether to hire someone to do this internally or pay for a service. And they decided that they're gonna pay for a company to service it. Make sure that we establish this, right? Um, and in that, you for the service level agreement, you would need to state like the uptime, the performance and the security to be fulfilled. So coming in as a contracted individual, this is expected of you as well, okay? And if you don't meet that, basically no pay because no, you don't meet service license agreement or service level agreement. The governance, so you have to have implement governance and change management processes because we talked about how when we have change, right? Uh, and then how what we would need to have control on how we manage our infrastructure. I put down some of the links for you for some of the scanning tools. These are the more popular one these days, but you open VAS um, is fun. So we'll see some of that. So today we will perform fuzzing through Nictal. And I, I don't put this in the proper term for my, my pen testing class yet because you know, but Nictal is used quite a bit because it's an easy tool to use. Um, we will have a Z attack proxy down the line, but today we're just gonna do a, a burp suite with uh, with a little bit of proxy listener. The wireless assessment you can use aircraft ng. Hashcat is a very old but commonly used tool and also Reaver. Okay. okay, so we talked about fuzzing for 14. For 15, the type of tools for web applications, we mentioned Nikto, and you can do proxy interception with Z attack proxy. There's Proxify um, in Kali Linux. So it changes, right? Like I said, it grows and sometimes they remove some tools that you know they don't they don't are no longer supported. But one of the common tools that you see a lot of professional runs to is Burp Suite. And unfortunately, the the free one without registration for an account, you're not going to have too much of access to it. But if you have access to the whole burp suite, burp suite, you you see that it does the features are really it's worth it to to use. Part Swigger, they put up some tutorial videos for this, so. Uh, you can go to their website and look up some information and they have a series of videos on how you can use it. So this is a these are so when you learn these tools and practice these tools and 
you learn them well, right? Like I give you some of the steps so that way you see that it works and it can be used for scan. And we move on to the next tool, but you have to revisit and use it if you're going to put it on your resume because they will ask you a question about it and you don't want to not know the answer. If not in advance uh, for that tool, but at least like you can tell them what you have used it for and how you use it. Okay, so it's important that you, you repractice these tools. So the wireless. So the metrics that we would use for analysis um, for your networks and system, we would use, we would use it for vector. How complex is the attack? The privileges, user interaction, integrity, availability, and the scope. Some of these you can already find, be, they can be found online through, you know, whether you would go through this or some of the documentation or even resources that you can find. They're really good at sharing and centralizing some of these resources like metrics. So guess what the master program is really mean to do? To make you do all of these metrics, to make sure that you are going to become the IT manager, the, the CISO down the line, right? That's what the master for cybersecurity is. Interpreting reports and, you know, or compiling reports or even that. <laughs> New question. I think some of the proxy tool that you see, um, some of them are integrated for attack purposes, not just listening, but a lot of the time when you listen like that, likely that you would perform some type of attack, like man in the middle or whatever, right? Um, so make sure that we research the tool before we use the tool because some of them are not really aimed for just scanning. It's scan and attack, right? So. They're very active. Okay. So here gives you an example. If you, you want to increase this image, you can, um, of how the metrics would look like. And this can be misleading where it says value, but those are just, you know, like the, the type of system or network that you're working with and you can see that they would label it and the description and then the score so this really tells you the exploit potential is the score the higher it is the the more priority that becomes, okay? And then for the, the that's the vector. For the attack complexity, they also have a score for that. So each of these, like each of these metrics would represent the area that it's supposed to fulfill. So think of them as lists, and then you would go down and define each of the lists. And on that list, you would state how exploitable they are and their score. Require privileges, so it would look like this.
And you can find templates or things that are already built. You just fill those in, right? They have some of the templates for you already. So for networking side, we would see that they deal with a lot with availability. And then development side, a lot of the times they work with user interaction matrix. Why is that? Because the easier it is, the less of a learning curve and more productivity you're going to see from that software. Okay, so let's look at the, at how we would calculate these things. So we want to calculate exploitability impact and impact function scores, right? This is a formula, right? I didn't just whip it out of the blue. It's not just in the book, it's on the website. So you can also see, you can also use the calculator. So you would take one, you would subtract and on the inside, your confidentiality score would be plugged in multiply it by one minus the integrity score, and then multiply it by one minus the availability score because these are our objectives in security. They have like a calculator that's built out already. And there are websites that you can use to plug all of these in. So the impact score, how can we determine the impact score? That will be scope that's unchanged. This is a value that's given to us. Think of it just like a number that's used, okay? It's not something that's, that's there's way that you can quantify that, but just to keep it simple for you, because some people in this industry, they just want a statistic and basic math and that's it, right? So. You would take the value 6.42 multiply by the ISS, which you calculated from up here. So you just need subtract multiplication addition for most part. If your scope has changed, the, the number is different, 7.52. And then you have to subtract. So this is an example, right? You have to subtract for the changes. Then you get the sub score, and this is also 8.22 is a fixed value that you would take and multiply by attack vector, attack complexity, privilege required, and user interaction. Okay, so let's do this. So given the score, determine the impact sub score. So we've, we need to have the ISS calculated first right, based on our confidentiality, integrity, and availability score. Many of these, the, the, the score ranking, you know, that comes from your analysis results from your analysis system. So many of the software that you see from CM would be able to provide this for you. So given that your confidentiality is 0 0.65, Integrity is 0 0.35 and availability is 0, 0.00. How do you calculate the ISS? So I put the formula there for you again. You can copy and paste it from the notes so you remember. You just plug in confidentiality, which is 0 0.065 here. So I'll highlight that for you to see. And then your integrity was given 0 0.35. And then availability, not impacted. So 0 0.00. So you process the stuff from the parentheses on the inside and work it outwards, right? So we take one, subtract 0 0.65, we have 0 0.35. We take one, subtract 0 0.35, we got 0 0.65. Take those two, multiply it together, multiply it by one, it is equal to itself. And then take that and subtract from one, 
and you have 0 0.7725. That's your ISS, your, your subscore for the impact. Then for the next step, we're going to use the result, which is 0 0.7725. And we're going to calculate the, the impact score. Because remember that this first part for number 17, that's just a subscore, right? We're only looking at the subscore for these three. Oh, what happened? Uh, Evacuation drill, but from outside the state college. Oh, evacuation drill. Should we go outside? We should go outside. Oh, it's RCC. Well, never mind. I was like, Riverside? We're not Riverside? Oh, thank you for reminding me. I was like, I don't want to stand in the dark outside for nothing. <laughs> okay. So once you have the sub score, Earlier, when you look back at the note, you just take the impact, assuming that we don't have any changes, right, in the scope. So in scope creep, sometimes, you know, you can add and subtract things. Um, while you're doing it, that would change your scope, okay? So assuming that everything is intended as the beginning, we don't have any changes. So you just take 6.42, you would multiply it by your subscore. So I... I I took 6.42, multiply it by the result from question 17, which gives me the impact of 4.96. Any questions? You will be expected to calculate this for our final exam and certification, they do ask you about, you know, what the impact subscore, but I don't think they require you for calculation, pretty sure. Um, this is good for the, your job. So want to make sure you know what this is, right? You can really impress an interviewer by telling them that you know how to calculate vulnerability impacts. Definitely the security people. <laughs> and then some of them don't care about that. They're like, what? <laughs> but it's good to know, right? I, I provided you with the link so you can go in and you can take a look. Uh, So now, after we have 18, we're going to move on and we are, so so your first step is to determine the impact subscore of the vulnerability based on your report, right? CIA. After that, the next step is to calculate the impact score, not the, use, using the subscore, whether to have changes or not right and and the value when that multiplies different between scope change and no scope change then the the third step is to calculate the exploitability so that way you would have it on your report okay. because that's the whole point in finding vulnerabilities to to um to find the exploitability so we'll start with the sub score just like the iss so the equation is given to us the exploitability sub score is 8.22 multiplied by attack vector attack complexity privilege required high and user interaction scores, right? And that's come from the matrix, okay? So let's say that we're given 0.8 for attack vector score, 0.77 for complexity score, privileges is 0.8, and user interaction score is 0.75. 
You just take 8.22 and you multiply all of those values together and you have 3.04, which is the subscore for exploitability. Is that understandable? It's a product, right? So, we're not done yet. We have <laughs> other steps to calculate. This is the most math that you would see for this in statistics. Of course. You have to understand the basic of statistics. I can't emphasize that enough. They're going to make you take stats if you major in cybersecurity. And I think linear algebra or college or, you know, even intermediate algebra is probably sufficient. But most university, they would require you to take some time in pre-cal or intermediate algebra. Leaving high school, I think now is the requirement for the state anyway. So, but fear not, it's not math heavy but it's technical heavy, right? Like you have to know the tools, the steps, the things like your second nature. Any question? So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible because if you do look at the website, it can be very confusing because you're like, oh, wait, what do I do? But the formulas are there. The textbook that I chose for this class, um, they actually break it down pretty simple. I tried to capture some of it onto your notes and then I use some of the resources from the website. Okay, so once you have the exploitability subscore, then now you're gonna calculate the CVSS, which is our goal, right? So bless you. So you now take the, the two score, the impact score, and the, the exploitability subscore, you're gonna add them together and you know, ranking from, so here, what I would see is use the categorical scale to determine the CVSS score where it's none, right? The vulnerability next to no existence low medium high or critical and so if we're if we're ranking them if we divide it up to you know zero to this and they have the breakdown for it on the website as well um is a certain level eight would be a high but not critical so can something can something severely go wrong by not doing this correctly yes might not be immediate, but over a while, a period. If the vulnerability is not addressed and someone is, you know, so let's say that it's highly impacted and you analyze it as low impact, that can change, right? But now we know how to quantify it. So you, you should be able to see whether it's low, none, high, medium, et cetera. Let me move 20 down in case you're still working on that. So how should a cybersecurity professional, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to add the word professional. You can add that. Reconcile the vulnerability results. You would refer to sources of information such as logs, CM log entries, configuration management system information to prove the facts of the existing issues, right? So the evidence or the fact that we're going to get are from logs. As I mentioned to you before, that's, that's where you're going to operate a lot. So you have to get used to reading logs, looking at different types of logs, looking at configuration management system, so configuration management system, it does an inventory of what was configured, what kind of settings for a certain type of services or, you know, applications and so on. So the information is provided to you. 
So if you can make that process of just analyzing logs and, and looking at this type of information a little bit more streamlined, your job will be a lot easier, right? Like there was a question to me earlier, what is expected to be the time? Really, it, it's really depending on the scope of the system and you know how, and we have to consider like the amount and, and all of that, right? But you have to work smarter than harder. That's my advice for you. Also think out of the box, right? What are, and always think about like, what are other alternative ways to address or to achieve the same goal? So we have to become more efficient and skilled, right? We're almost, almost done. And then I'll let you have a break and then we'll do our not too long lap. It seems long, but it's not. And I hope it's not, won't be as frustrated as last week. <laughs> <laughs> I tested that one. The, you, you know, when I taught it last, I should have done a little bit more testing. I just didn't have time to test it before class and it kind of fall apart at the end, but. This one I did test it, you know, all the way down to birth. So you should be all right. Yeah, this is why people like to use cloud-based lab where it's very controlled, right? They use a specific version. Yes, I can have you download the last year version of Kali and, and do the same thing. Um, but when you update, it changes because software updates and we need to update our software to use the latest tool, right? We just talked about that. So we wanna practice what we say. And I wanna make sure you you know the current stuff, right? Because you're like, oh, Dr. Wynn showed me how to do this, but it doesn't work now. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Need to troubleshoot. Okay, so you saw the calculation and then the categorizing of CVSS score. This is standard, right? So you would see that here. This is where I came up with A for high. And then we talked about, you know, positive report, fault, fault, false positive, where it your positive report contain vulnerability. Your false positive report contain vulnerability that doesn't exist. Okay. So you're overcautious in that type of report. The negative report contain does not contain vulnerability that exists. I'd rather operate here than here, but ideally you should be accurate, right? So we need to confirm the report, check your logs, and that information is here on page nine. You need to learn the trends right? These are some of the areas you need to look at and some area takes a while, right? So to look at the vulnerabilities, missing firmware and updates, this happens in a lot of IoT devices. So if you have IoT devices, right? Check in that area, more web-based applications and so on. It goes on, the list goes on. Now, for web app vulnerability, you're going to see the CVE today, right? When you scan, when you see the CVE, it's going to show you whether it has, you know, some kind of cross-site scripting. So XSS for cross-site scripting, there are different types. So persistent means that it stored the attack code on the server, where reflected is that it sends the user somewhere else. And then directory traversal, this is used a lot by inserting a path into the query. So that way you can go into like a folder that contains password or secret information for that web app. And with that, you can use it for credential stuffing and password spraying. So I'm giving you some additional term here. These might come up for certification purposes. So make sure we know, right? Password spraying is to use a list for login, those are pre-made lists and that can be integrated with different form of attack. And then the credential stuffing is 
connects to log in to different websites. So you know how some people say have the same password uh, and they use it over and over again across many different websites? Well, credential stuffing is that, right? They, if they know one password, they're gonna try other apps with the same password. So session hijack, take over the session by finding the key and the cookies information to gain control. But everybody gather cookies these days, so we hope that they privately keep your data and maintain it securely. But it's questionable, right? You saw the requirements is minimal, so sometimes they operate minimally. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. I'll be right, um, let me stop recording.